the foundations of the world is a reference to God's act of creation. When Scripture refers to something that has been true from the foundation of the world, it means for all of humanity history. But when Scripture refers to something that happens before the foundation of the world, the events under discussion occurred before anything was ever created in eternity past. Now, that's important, and we'll explain that as we go on. Ephesians 1.4 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This is an amazing passage with emphasis on God choosing before the world was even created, those, you and I, who would become believers. Hmm. Did you ever know that? Foundation. So when we talk in the Bible, man, you, you got you to go back to eternity past. Before a foundation of the world. Before God created anything at all, at least three things were already true. God saw mankind as lost and in need of a Savior. The eternal Savior was present, and the details of the work of redemption were planned out. In all of this, God had our transformation to holiness in view before the foundation of the world. As a matter of fact, 2 Timothy 1.9, Paul, Apostle Paul says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Jesus Christ before time began. 2 Timothy 1 through 10, and this is not on there. This is something that I want to start with with you. But has, the next verse, but God has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, this is Paul talking, an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Gentile, anybody who's not a Jew. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I committed to him until that day. Genesis 1 and 2. This is just, I'm not going to read the whole Bible here. I just want to make sure that you understand where this is coming from. It didn't just happen. It didn't just happen in the New Testament. It, it was from eternity past. He says, in the beginning, that is a thesis or belief statement which can be paraphrased in the story of God's, here is the story of the creation of the heavens and the earth. Chapters 1 and 2 says the focus is on the creation of a material world and heavens and earth. Created means to fashion anew. This often used word in the Bible always has God as its subject. Here it means that God renews that was in chaos, in a chaotic state. God changed chaos into cosmos, disorder into order, and emptiness into fullness. Chaos to, the, to order, darkness to light. Darkness. Darkness is a biblical symbol of evil and wrong. You hear evil and wrong, it ain't about God. And in these verses, it also says, when you see that Genesis 1 through 2, it also says that the Spirit of God was hovering. Genesis 1, 3 through 5, and I'm paraphrasing, but it says, his command, when God said, let there be light, his command caused reality, starting point. That's where we started. Life. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from darkness. Knowledge, we would, without knowledge, we wouldn't, know, we wouldn't know darkness, right? If it was no tall, you wouldn't know short. If it wasn't any good, you wouldn't know bad. So 
he's making a reference to knowledge. Knowledge is opening the light in our hearts and letting us see that there is a difference, and because there is a difference, there's a purpose for it being a difference. Then he said, God called a light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, and it was literally the first day. This shows God's creative power and absolute control. Hmm. The physical light that God made on the first day of creation is a, you listening? Say amen. The physical light that God made on the first day of creation is a picture of what he does in every heart that trusts in Christ, the true light. Now, what I don't know if you've ever read this, but he talks about there is light, one, two, three, four, five. And he goes way down to 14, and he creates the, the firmament in the heaven. And, and he, said, he said, now listen, what this explains is that, first of all, this is a time. There is a timeline. Life, right? In life, there is birth and there is death, but there is a timeline. So he's already telling us that there is a timeline to all of this. And he says, um, there is also an end. That spells it out very, 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 very fair for us so that we understand that. He says, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament, that's heaven or sky of heaven, to divide the day from the night. And let them be for a sign, a season, and for a day, and for a year. And let them for light be light for the, in the firmament of the heavens and give light on the earth. And it was so. So what he's saying already is that time is spaced out. So you have a certain, we, what, we can tell what time is. We can, tell, we can tell how old we are, for that matter. So then God made, this is what I'm talking about. He, he said, let there be light in one, two, and three up here. And he says, in 16, then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in that firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over day and over night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. These words express a principal theme of the Bible. God bringing light into darkness. The New Testament records God sending his son to be light of the world. And in the end, there will no longer be any darkness at all. Now, the problem with that is Adam and Eve. Of course, he told them not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everybody knows that, right? Well, some of us know that. The problem is they were disobedient. That act of disobedience spiritually caused harm and damage, which is spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness is a state of a person who is living apart from God. You don't want to be living apart from God. Hmm. As a matter of fact, Isaiah prophesied that a Messiah speaks of a deep spiritual darkness that enveloped people. Isaiah 9.2 says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them, the light has shone. Now, what you probably didn't get is he said, have seen. The future events is described by the prophet under the urging of the Holy Spirit as if they have already occurred. He's prophesying in, down here, but he's speaking as though it has already occurred. That's important to know. Matter of fact, John 8, 12 says this. There is no need to walk in darkness. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. As the sun is the physical light of the world, so Jesus is the spiritual light of the world. As the light of the world, Jesus exposes sin and darkness and gives light and sight. That's knowledge. I see that. I see that. We say that with our eyes, but we also see it with our minds. Spiritual salvation. Matthew 4, 6 says this. Stay with me. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. This passage announces that those who have come to know God of Israel through his son, Jesus Christ, are the ones who have been delivered from spiritual darkness. 
and now walk in the light of God's life. Amen? Speaking of light, light in the Old Testament was meant to represent everything good and valuable. I just told you about darkness is what it is. It's especially tied to the idea of knowledge and guidance. That's why I talked to you about growing in the grace and knowledge. Light is a metaphor or a figure of speech for God's law, which illuminates the path that leads us to every life. You remember what he said in Psalms 19, 105? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Light stands also for God's blessing, his presence, his revelation. That is the incarnate embodiment of Jesus Christ. Let me say the scripture so you'll hear that. Isaiah 2, 5 says, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. He's talking about Jesus Christ. So with the indwelling Holy Spirit, we, we, we see the light. What do we say in the world? Oh, yeah, I see that. Oh, yeah, the light turned on. And some people say stuff they probably shouldn't say, like the light turned on, nobody's home. You never want to say that. That's an insult. God made life for a reason. God made light so that we would understand, so that we would know who he is. Also, a common analogy or parable in the Bible. Proverbs 4, 8 says, light symbolizes righteousness. Philippians 2.15 said it represents blameless and pure. Matthew 5 and 16, it sees you, your good deeds. And Philippians 76 through 4, it says you are radiant with light. Now let me explain something. These scriptures I'm saying you're in the, on the back of the bulletin. So they're there for that reason because I can't stop and tell you about every single thing. And you know what? I tell you about studying the Word of God. When you study the Word of God, I mean, you can start reading and send you somewhere else and send you somewhere else and send you somewhere else. And if you are not in, in, in a state of mind or, or, or in a state of the Spirit where you understand that, man, you really could, could, could just miss what God is trying to say. So now that we know some things about light, do we? I said a, st- a lot of stuff about light, so everybody was saying, yes. Okay. The truth is, God is light. Yeah. 1 John 5, 1, 5 through 10. I want to explain that because this is what it said. It's very important. It says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light. And in him, there no darkness at all. God did not just say, let there be light. He said, because of that, we should walk and live in light. Why do you say that, Mark? Because the next verse says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. God knows we need practice. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. That's righteousness. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. Justification, repentance. And the last verse says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Oh my gosh. To walk in the light is to live in such a way that we are enlightened by the truth of who God is, grace and knowledge. Now, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And if you remember the seven I am statements in John, he says these statements that I am, I am, I am. The second one says, I am. He says, I am that light of the world. That's what he said. That points to his unique divinely. Anytime you hear somebody say divinely, it means godly. That is, that, that, 
points out to his unique divinely identity and purpose in declaring himself to be the light of the world. Jesus was claiming that he is the exclusive source of spiritual light. No other source of spiritual light is available to mankind. He is our Savior. I wonder where Buddha and Muhammad is. Not being disrespectful, but Dane alive. There's only one spiritual light. The point is to see and know Christ's glory is to share in God's glory for eternity. Jesus says what? I am the way, and I came to do my Father's will. Now, unlock the Old Testament, that light we're talking about, the Holy Spirit or presence of God. In the Old Testament, it was a little bit different. Remember Moses, he went up to the mountain. When he went up to the mountain and he talked to God, he came back and he was like flush red light so bright that people couldn't even look at him. So much that he had to wear a mask. Well, eventually, after leaving the presence of God, it faded away. That's not the light that we have in the New Testament. The light in Paul's face shine. Remember Paul's experience on Damascus Road when God shined the light on him and said, Paul, why are you doing that stuff? That's when God's light was shown on Paul's heart, and it was the light Paul has shown to all who would listen to the gospel of salvation from sin through faith in Jesus. But unlike that light of the Old Testament, the glory that shines from the face of Christ will never fade. It's eternal life, and it brings us eternity. Because of that light that shone on Paul's face, Paul was given a stewardship of that light. Colossians 1, 24 and 25 points that out. What it says is, now I rejoice. This is Paul. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction for the state of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me to, to, for you to fulfill the word of God. That's Paul's credentials. He's telling you who he is. He's telling you who sent him. He's telling you he's apostle. Apostle, what means sent? That means he's sent. In these verses, the apostle Paul is making a point that Jesus suffered. He, Paul, suffered. We, you, and I will endure the suffering that Christ would be enduring if he were still here Physically. Hmm. Paul says that he received a stewardship from God to preach this divine, godly Christ who had reconciled the world. It was Paul's ministry. Paul preached Christ. But we too are responsible to God to preach Christ. That's where we talk evangelism. That's passed through us. Christ was the first of many. What he did, we do. We become sanctified, and we be, because we are, we become more like Christ. We're not Christ. We do what Christ did. Paul also teaches in that about suffering. The verse I just read. I'm still talking about the verse I just read. He talks about suffering. And remember, Christ told his disciples that if the world hated him, they would hate his followers. If people persecuted him, they would persecute his followers. But Paul believed he was suffering the afflictions God wanted or allowed him to endure. But instead of facing that with difficulty and dread, he saw this trouble as a time of joy. Huh? Because those troubles were producing an eternal reward, God's purpose. Man, we're doing something from God, for God. I mean, we're in, we're, that's the glory of God, doing what God intended for whatever it is to do. The sun shines light, God intended. That's giving glory to God. Flowers grow. That's giving glory to God because God intended. When you do what God has intended for you to do, you are giving glory to God. Paul's message also spoke of an eternal reward, the life of Christ in us. 
is our hope of eternal glory. The Apostle Paul also calls that indwelling with Christ a great mystery. And what do you mean by that, Mark? Colossians 1, 26 and 27 says this. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And in that verse, he calls us the Lord's people. The Lord's people. Oh, my God. And let's start by clarifying something. Like I said before, because he's talking about you and me, he's not talking about Gentiles. Gentiles are Jewish people. So everybody who's not a Gentile, I mean, who's not a Jew is a Gentile. Everybody who's not a Jew is a Gentile. And he's talking about this former, this former mystery. He said, this former mystery now understood is that Christ in us is the hope of our future glory, the Holy Spirit of God. Hmm. Let me explain that. That's very, very, very important. That's why we're who we are. That's why we're here. That's why when you become born again, God just don't take you and say, okay, you're born again. Come home. Because there's stuff that we have to do. And this is what he says. That spiritual stewardship is passed on to us. We are light bearers, that light that I'm talking about. So then our lives become a vehicle or are used to transport or express and display the life of Christ. Okay. So what do you mean, Mark? 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 10. I'm going to stay here a minute because this is about us. This is about our, the light we have. Okay. This is what he says. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory. There's that knowledge again. Displayed in the face of Christ. What does Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing, that means incomparable, power, is from God and not from us. The Spirit of God is still hovering, by the way. And then he also talks about those sufferings. Earlier in here, he says, this is what they look like. And and you tell me if you don't see these every day or not, because I know I do. He said, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. He said, perplexed, which means confused, but not in despair, which means hopeless. He said, we're persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Oh, my. Let me talk about that, man. Let me look at a closer look. 4.6, he said, as God commanded the light to shine in the darkness at creation, so he turned on the light in our hearts. Why? So we can see who Jesus Christ is. People who do not believe are blinded by Satan. That's 2 Corinthians 4.4. But believers see the light. 4.7 says, the treasure or divine revelation of Jesus Christ is in a common clay pot. Us, you, me, we be the clay pot, the jar. The reason why God places such a valuable treasure in a lowly vessel, is that it might be apparent to all that the power of the gospel is of God and not of that clay pot. Hmm. In our ordinary human condition of weakness, he says we are but jars of clay holding a priceless treasure, the life of Christ in us. The challenges we face, persecution, Trial, hardship, and suffering we endure serves or happens to pour out the all-surpassing power of God and reveal the life of Jesus Christ to all around us. That means that everything we go through, we believe in Jesus Christ and we go through it. Others see that and say, hmm, why are they happy? Because that's Jesus Christ. It shows them that we got something bigger. We got something else going on. And we can rest assured that we will not 
be overcome in all these afflictions because we have that treasure of Jesus Christ living in us. And what does he say? We are more than conquerors. Amen, amen. He says the treasure, the treasure or divine revelation of Jesus Christ is in a clay pot. The reason why God places such valuable treasure in that lowly vessel, us, is that it might be apparent that that all-surpassing power of the gospel is God and not the vessel, but God himself. Then he goes on to talk through those afflictions. I'm going to talk to those a little bit and tell you what they mean, because if you don't know, you won't understand how important this is. It says, hard-pressed is translated afflicted in 2 Colossians 1.6. In the Greek text, an identical expression occurs where it says, troubled on every side. That's what we're going through. He says, but also, it's Outside, we're afflicted. Inside, we have fears. You know we do. Because when things are coming at us, for, if it's only for a minute, we're saying, oh, Lord. And that's, 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 that's when most of us pray. Like, we should pray all the time. And he says, on every side, meaning inside and out. These are afflictions now. Yet Paul was not crushed. He used the Greek word for, for the words for narrow space. So he said, we're in a narrow space, man. All these things are coming at us inside, outside, every direction. And then he said, perplexed. Wow. Perplexed is derived from two Greek words. The word for no plus the word for way. Perplexed means to be at a loss. And sometimes, sometimes we can be there. He said, we are perplexed when we see no way out, hopeless. Yet Paul was not in despair. As believers, we will face those trials. Being a believer don't mean that you're exempt from that. It just means that everything that everybody else goes through in life, you go through with a different light on you. You go through with a different belief, a different knowledge and knowing it's for a purpose. And that purpose, a greater purpose is for God. He says, we must remember that God controls trials, uses them to strengthen us, our faith. God's glory is manifested, displayed through broken vessels. How? This is how it happened. Through people, us, who endure those troubles by relying on his power. Man, man, that's, 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 that's hallelujah. That's hallelujah. Yeah. 4.9, he says this. The picture behind the word persecuted is here being pursued by someone determined to harm, to harm someone else. Paul was not forsaken by the Lord, but he was struck down. Case in point, literally, Acts 4.19, in the city of Lystra, a crowd stoned Paul. Stoned him, tried to kill him. But he wasn't destroyed, he wasn't killed. The Lord spared his life so he could continue to preach the good news and testify God's deliverance, God's saving grace. God saved him. God said, I got other things to, for you to do. You might be hurt. You might have all those things going on, but get up. I got stuff for you to do. Most important of that whole verse that I read is 10 and 11, and this is what it says. It's talking about the expression. The expression carrying about, carrying about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus is explained as being delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Die to self, born again to serve. In his service for Christ, Paul constantly faced death so that life, the life of Christ may also be manifested. God's deliverance of Paul was evident. Why? Because he's alive. Jesus is alive. Huh. For, Paul, the death and the Paul, for Paul, the death and resurrection of Jesus was a model for his ministry in his suffering he participated in Jesus' suffering and death. Like Jesus, like Paul. But Paul endured all types of hardships, produced eternal life in those whom he preached the gospel. Guess what? He was obedient to God. And he did that for us. Paul did that for us. I, and and, and here's, here's this. It says, in the same way Jesus' death was merely a precursor, meaning a forerunner, something that happened before. 
in the same way that it's a forerunner to his resurrection to eternal life. That means it had to happen for eternal life to happen. Eternal life happened so that we could have eternal life. He rose from the dead. Huh. Our belief without him rising from the dead would not be worth it. But he did. He got up. There was this little booklet that I, that, that I, that I read, and I'm saying this because I think it was very nice the way he put it. Of course, it's imaginary, but this, this author, his name is Robert Munger, and he describes a Christian life as a house. And this is what he says. When Jesus enters, he goes from room to room. In the library of our mind, Christ sorts through the garbage, cleaning out the worthless trash. In the kitchen, he de deals with our unhealthy appetites and our sinful desires. At the dining room table, he serves us the bread of life to satisfy our hungry souls and pours living water for us to drink and never be thirsty again. Through the dark hallways and closets, Jesus uncovers all the places where sin hides. Huh. He works his way through every nook and cranny until his love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace have filled every space. Oh, my gosh. It doesn't become any plainer. Than it. You, all y'all, he's been in a house if you don't have a house. So all of you know what that means. This presents a picture of what it means to have Christ in us. The mystery that he was talking about in this verse is that Christ now lives within us. Remember, he passed along. He passed along the mantle, Paul did. Why is that a mystery? Paul said the mystery is the union of Jews and Gentiles in one body, the church, Christ's church. In fact, it says that Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partake of his promises in Christ. Through the gospel. Huh. Remember Genesis 12, 3? What did he say? Remember what Abraham said? He said, I will be a blessing to those who bless you, or I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's what he said that. But it did not reveal that this one thing that's very, that kind of threw the Jews off. What it did, it, it was equality as the Jews in one body, a secret never told before. You know why? They didn't know that we were going to be everything that they were, that we were going to be part of that body of Christ, and most important, that we were going to be heirs like their heirs. That's the difference. That's what the mystery was. The light on us. 1 Corinthians 1, 6, 19, Paul states, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Oh, you are not your own. And we receive Jesus as Lord. He becomes our master. And with that comes that hope of glory included in our resurrection. Romans eight eleven says, If the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raises Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit that lives in you. I ain't playing. Spirit lives in us. I'm telling you what he's saying. This is the resurrection life in, 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 in spo spoken in Philip, Philippians 3.10. Very important. Listen and say Amen. Paul indicates that he rejected or dismissed his own righteousness, which means his worthiness, his self, in order to secure, listen at this, three things. Not only an intellectual knowledge of Christ, meaning a renewing of the mind, but also relational knowledge with Christ, growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. In fact, he said an intimate knowledge of him, Christ, personally, day-to-day -day relationship. Those are our spiritual disciplines. We do that in church on Sunday morning. There is reading the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, and praying. Those are the spiritual disciplines. We do that here. We do praise and worship. Pastor comes, says the Word. We meditate on that Word. Then we pray at the end of the service. 
That's our sanctification process. That's how we grow to be like Christ. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into the They use it two ways. Sometimes they say wonderful life. Sometimes they say marvelous life. You got it, man. I like that. All that is being said is how are we to live our life in light of Christ's return? Because you know he's coming back. So what should we be doing? This is it. We believe that the return of Jesus is imminent. That is, his turn could occur at any moment. Get your life together. The time of his coming is something God has not revealed to anyone. And so until he calls us to himself, we should continue serving him. Are you serving him? We got an awful lot of spots in this church that ain't being filled by us serving him. We serve God by being God's feet on the ground. We serve God by telling people and bringing people into the body of Christ. That takes I can't count that high. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 18 says it like this. Therefore we do not lose heart though outwardly we are wasting away yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. This is what he said. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And I'm getting ready to close, so you don't want to miss this, right? It includes a heavenly inheritance. 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4 says this, In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never, never, never spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, for us. And in closing, this is what I want to say, because we talked about light. Man, I told y'all so much about light, y'all got probably, probably got shadows at this point. In the end, there will be no light, no darkness is what he said. How do you know that, Mark? Because we'll be in the New Jerusalem. And if you read Revelations 21, 23, it says, the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminates it. The Lamb is its light. Y'all ought to be praising God, man. And we're just waiting for you to finish, Mark. That's what, that's what we're waiting for. God is good. God is good. So what I've told you is that from the beginning, eternity past, you were given a purpose. In eternity past, he knew how he was going to do all of this. And through all of the stuff that I have just told you is what, when, where, and how. Hmm. And you didn't even know who you was. Your mom and daddy didn't know who you was. Their mom and daddy didn't know who you was. Your relatives didn't know who you was. But God knew who you were. God knew who you are. But do you know who you are? Ah, the children of God, the holy priesthood. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on, OPT.